across the fence, we're tracking the beautiful but elusive bobcat. We'll learn about bobcat's habitat, health, and hunting prowess. Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. The eastern bobcat is common throughout most of Vermont, but it's rarely seen. There are two main reasons for the lack of bobcat sightings. The cats are solitary by nature, and they're generally most active at dawn and dusk. But this afternoon, you're going to get a chance to see bobcats in the wild, thanks to technology involving a remote camera. And we're fortunate to have Vermont's leading expert on bobcats with us this afternoon. I want to welcome Kim Royer. Kim is a veteran wildlife biologist with the Vermont Department of Fish and Wildlife and the former leader of the state's Fur Bearer Project. Well, thanks so much for coming in. Thanks for having me, Judy. So is the bobcat native to Vermont? It is, yes. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of three native felids to Vermont and is actually the most common uh, one in Vermont and actually across the country as well. Are there other wildcats in Vermont? There are. Um, there is the lynx, which was a very rare cat and still is relatively rare. It's on the endangered species list. Um, and mountain lions were also native to Vermont, but we believe are extirpated right now. So the bobcat is the remaining common cat. That's funny because just, just this morning we got um, something from the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department saying that a lynx has been spotted in southern Vermont, which is pretty exciting. It's very exciting because we have had some sightings in the last 10 or 15 years in the Northeast Kingdom, but um, we had a sighting last spring in Londonderry and then also last spring a uh, photo that was sent to us very recently of a lynx crossing under uh, Route 9, which was an underpass that uh, we'd actually worked with VTrans to put in for mm -hmm. wildlife crossing. So that was really exciting. So tell me a little bit about uh, what we know about the current population of bobcats in Vermont. Uh, well, they're common and abundant. Um, we have animals, bobcats, pretty much throughout the state. Um, they're an animal that uses forested habitat primarily. Um, does not like habitat that's been converted to fields or to development. So they primarily use forests and scrub shrubs habitat and wetlands. So now we see a map here. What is this? So this is a uh, map that's based on a study that we did um, in the early 2000s. It was with um, UVM Cooperative Research Unit. Um, we had a graduate student that collared cats. And these are dots from a cat that has been collared that were collected on a GPS collar and it shows you the kind of use, landscape use, that the, the, that particular cat That's used. just one cat. That's one cat traveling across the landscape. Um, and you can see that it's using the forested habitat. The darker green area is all forested habitat. The lighter green is mostly fields. It's really avoiding the fields. It really seems to be avoiding the fields. And that's what this study showed. Mm -hmm. And so um, here's another picture. What are we right. looking at? Right. So here? This, show, this is a different cat. Mm -hmm. This sort of shows you the, the extent of the home range and um, how large an area the, that cat will travel, um, covering several different towns. This is another um, photo of a different cat that shows how they'll use stream corridors oh, for yeah. moving across the landscape. There's a stream that runs through there, and that's how it's crossing the road, is actually using the uh, scrub shrub habitat on either side of the stream or the forested habitat. Tell me a little bit about the bobcat's habitat. So this study actually, the reason we did it was to determine whether there were any critical habitats for bobcats. And what we found was that they use wetlands heavily. Um, they use those stream corridors very heavily. Um, they will use rocky ledges as denning sites um, and refugia from other types of animals and, and people. And also because the exposure in those rocky ledges is often south or west facing and it's much warmer than in other places. Um, and they use forested habitats in general. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned, uh, we mentioned earlier that they usually travel dawn or dusk. Right, they, they're most active at dawn or dusk or during the night. And we actually would program those cameras, of those collars, so that we got the, the points during dawn and dusk. And they'll actually travel um, faster through poor quality habitat. Really? Yes. Um, poor quality habitat for them. For them, exactly. So if they're trying to get from one place to another and it's habitat that's been converted to field or development, and there's a little brushy area between like a hedgerow, they'll use that hedgerow to move, but actually they'll move at a faster pace than they do in regular forested habitat or wetland habitat. Now, do they climb trees? They do climb trees, yes. Tell mm -hmm. me a little bit about that. Will they? They're, well, they have uh, retractable claws, just like a domestic cat, mm -hmm. and they're good climbers. Um, they they mostly hunt on the ground, but they will also climb trees. And what's a bobcat's keenest sense? 
Mostly uh, it uses its eyes and its ears. Just like a domestic cat, they have very large eyes um, and they're very attracted to movement and so they stalk. And as you could see in that video, he was walking and there was an open space that so he was definitely staying close enough to the woods. So right, and he feels comfortable there because of the, the woods on either side. And so are bobcats known to be aggressive? I mean, do you have to worry about them? No, not, not they're very secretive. They, I've actually had um, collared cats within maybe three to five feet of me that I couldn't see because it was so brushy and that cat never came anywhere near me. Um, so they'll run from us if possible. The only times we've ever had interactions with people is we've had a few rabid cats um, mm. that will get very so weird acting. So that's a good uh, head, heads up for people. If, if they see a bobcat and it's not afraid of you, that's right. It could be then something, something wrong probably it. wrong. Unless you're a turkey hunter, all dressed in camo, and sometimes they'll be calling a turkey, and the bobcat doesn't realize that it's actually a human instead of a turkey, <laughs> and it might approach pretty closely. So what's the reproductive cycle of the bobcat? Uh, they generally mate February to March or April, and um, they have a two-month gestation period. So uh, the kittens are born anywhere from April to June. Um, the kittens, they, they have den sites, and the, the female actually um, stays with the kittens for quite a long time. Um, the kittens tend to leave the den sites um, in about six weeks, four to six weeks. Mm -hmm. And the male is no the longer male, in the picture. Right, the male does not help much at all. Um, how big do they get? Um, the females are smaller than the males. The males tend to be quite a bit larger. Uh, females may weigh 15 to 18 pounds. Males can get up to 40 pounds, a large one. And you mentioned too that they can actually take down a deer. They can, actually. Um, they, we've done some food studies on bobcats back in the 40s, so it was a long time ago. Um, but I think 30 some odd percent of this content, stomach contents was, was deer. Hmm. Uh, but they also generally will focus on snowshoe hare, cottontail rabbits, and small mammals. And so I, I know that in my own yard I haven't seen a bobcat. My kids have seen one years ago, but there are traces, <laughs> bits and pieces of bunnies every once in a while, and I'm just wondering if that's what that is. It's possible, but there's also many other, there's um, fisher that will take uh, rabbits, there's foxes that will take rabbits, uh, coyotes that take rabbits. So rabbits are kind of like the ubiquitous prey species <laughs> for everything that's out there. So now when do th uh, these animals develop their coats? Because their fur is really beautiful. Right. Well, they're prime, what's called prime in the wintertime usually. Mm -hmm. um, so in the summer, just like a domestic dog or cat, the coats get much thinner. And then um, as they get as they get into the colder periods, then the coats will get much thicker, especially the underfur gets very thick, and the guard hairs get very long and Now, beautiful. you brought a couple of examples to I show did. us. I did, yes. I brought, well, I wanted to show folks the difference between a bobcat and a lynx, mm -hmm. because we get a lot of sightings. Um, people think they've seen a lynx when they're just seeing a very large bobcat. So the things that people need to look for, this is a bobcat right here, okay. and this is a lynx. And the things that we want people to check is uh, the difference in the tails. So this is the bobcat mm -hmm. with the white tip. Oh, okay. The top of the tail is black, but uh, the bottom like of the tail tip. is white. And that white is very obvious most of the time, whereas a lynx has an all black tip. Okay. Very distinctive feature. Uh, and another thing to look for, which is a little harder to describe uh, because it's a little subjective, but this is the foot of a bobcat. Mm -hmm. And this is a foot of the lynx. And mm -hmm. you can see the lynx Huge. is adapted to deep, fluffy snow. Mm -hmm. The bobcat's at the northern edge of its range here in Vermont and does not do well in deep, fluffy snow. And it's, that's because its foot is so much smaller. It can't stay on top of the snow as well as a lynx can. Got it. So those are two of the features that we hope people will look for when they're trying to distinguish between one or the other. And the lynx are larger than the bobcat. They'll, they may look larger because their legs are longer generally. Mm -hmm. uh, they may not weigh as much. If, if you have a large oh, male kidding. bobcat, it can actually weigh more than a female lynx. Uh, but they do look larger because they're fluffier and their tails are longer. So does the bobcat have a natural predator? Um, besides man, probably the natural predator um, in, this, in this day and age is fisher. Um, a, you know, a great horned owl might take a kitten at some point, but um, Mostly, um, it's starvation or disease that will kill bobcats. 
They mentioned the Fisher. Are there a lot of Fisher in Vermont? There are. Fisher's native as well, but it was reintroduced in the 1950s and 60s um, to actually control the porcupine population. Oh, really? Yeah. They were brought in by the Forest and Parks Department. Um, and so they actually um, are also very common and abundant now. And they're more aggressive, though, aren't they? Um, they can be more aggressive. I mean, these are all predators, so what, if you're a prey species, they're <laughs> aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> now, is there a bobcat hunting or trapping season? There is. Um, actually, bobcat were bountied uh, from the mid-1800s up until 1971, because back then, people's perception of any of these large predators were that um, they would take cattle or sheep or you know domestic right. animals. So they were bountied. Um, and the bounty was removed in, 1970, in 1971, and a season, a much more restricted season, was established in 1976. So there's a small, short, two-week trapping season right now and a month-long hunting season in the winter, January, February. And about how many cats are taken? Uh, for a long time, there was about, uh, the average was about 30. We're up to maybe about 100 now. Mm -hmm. And what's the population like now? Well, we don't have an actual population estimate, but... Um, we, we had, through that study that we did, um, we were able to establish some home range sizes and mm -hmm. extrapolate. Um, so maybe between, you know, 1,500 and, and 2,500, you know, it's very general and we really don't try to nail ourselves down to that because we don't have good figures for that. Right. What challenges do bobcats face in Vermont and northern New England? Well, part of the reason why we did the study is because we had concerns about habitat fragmentation and forest fragmentation. As you, as you could see from some of those um, visuals, they are tied to the forest or to scrub shrub. And if that gets um, converted to something else, developments or roads, then it makes bobcat movement across the landscape much harder. And they do move long distances. The male's home ranges might be 27 square miles. Wow. So they need connected habitats and good forest blocks. Can we take another look at those pelts too? Because sure. I understand that the ears as well are right. a telltale sign well, of they, which is which. They can be and actually I don't have very good tufts on these ears. You can see uh, here's a little tuft, here's a tuft on the lynx ear. Mm -hmm. um, and, like but the bobcats eyebrows. have tufts too. Mm -hmm. the, the lynx tend to have longer tufts than the bobcat but when I ask somebody did it have tufts? Were they long? It's hard for somebody to tell. <laughs> right, when unless they see you haven't seen That's side right, by side. exactly. Yes, yeah. And that probably would never happen. Right, it's hard. It's hard. <laughs> That's right. It doesn't happen in the wild. <laughs> so, what else do you want Vermonters to know about bobcats? Well, I think, again, that they are a common and abundant species. Um, they're not at risk. The population is not at risk. But they do require intact habitat, um, habitat that has uh, blocks that are connected by uh, vegetated areas of riparian areas, areas of streams that have forests on either side. Mm -hmm. And so you mentioned in studies that you've done with, with collaring some of these animals, are there plans to do more studies, um, more research on them? Uh, probably not in the near future. Those are very expensive mm -hmm. um, and we got the kind of information that we needed in order to protect bobcats and their habitats for the time being. Uh, so probably we'll transfer, we're doing work on lynx right now. Mm -hmm. And so as we mentioned, there was one sighting in southern Vermont. What, what happens after that once the Fish and Wildlife Department puts out one of those statements saying we've, we've seen these rare animals, right. what happens? Well, we actually um, have been doing some work in the Northeast Kingdom in the last few years. We've got trail cameras out. Um, we've been doing track count surveys in the wintertime in cooperation with a bunch of partners. Uh, just to try to monitor what's happening with that population. We'd sent out the press release so people will let us know if they see links because that's one way for us to also track what's happening with the population. Um, so that's the kind of thing that will start. And it, eventually, if the population grew, um, Maine did an extensive radio collar study on their lynx as their population expanded so that they could learn more about the habitat needs of the animal. Is there a thought that maybe this particular animal came from Maine originally? It's, yes, in fact, that's a really important point, is that lynx in particular need that connectivity between Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, and Canada. Mm -hmm. And so maintaining those large forest blocks and the habitat connectors that keep us linked up to other states and other countries is really important in the future of these populations. And climate change is gonna have an effect on lynx as well. You think so? Yeah, bobcats are probably gonna do better because they're at the northern edge of their range. Lynx um, are gonna have 
problems as the snow depths get less. Right, because they really, as you mentioned earlier, depend on the heavy snow. To outcompete bobcats and fisher and other animals like that. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us today. This has yeah. been a really interesting talk. Oh, great. Well, thank you for having me. If folks see one of these animals, should they call your department? Uh, especially a lynx. If they think they've seen a lynx, they should definitely give us a call. We'd be very interested. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. That's our program for today. I'm Judy Simpson. We'll see you again next time on Across the Fence. Thank you.